Hello and welcome to the Grand Touring Motorsports Podcast, Break, Fix, where we're always fixing to break into something motorsports related. Awesome and awkward all at the same time. That's how I like to describe the 90s, a time when bands like Nirvana, Sublime, and Green Day were all we would talk about, and the cars we salivated over had exotic names like Supra, RX-7, and GTR. That's right, Brad. And tonight, our special guest is fellow car enthusiast Mark Shank, who has called upon our panel of esteemed petrol heads to answer the question we love to ask, what should I buy? And in this case, 90s cars. So we want to welcome Mark to the show and our panel of GTMers that will be here with us tonight. So welcome, Mark. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk about this. I've been thinking about this project for a while uh, where I kind of go with my next car, and I think I have landed in the 90s, so I've been trying to figure out what I want to do. Before we dive down this rabbit hole, Mark, why don't you tell us a little about your car history and what you're driving today? Mm, car history. So uh, I, I kinda, I've kind of been all over the place. First kind of fast car that I had was a 94 Z28 Camaro. It was unfortunately an automatic. That was what I could afford at the time. The transmission went out on it and was able to put a shift kit in it, which was a lot of fun because it would kind of break transmission mounts on an annual basis. It shifted so hard. You could definitely break it loose between gears. Had a 98 Eclipse GST, which I absolutely loved. 2006 350Z, 2006 E46 M3 with the, with the manual. Let's see, uh, had 1985 Porsche 911 Carrera that I picked up in 2009 that I used as a daily uh, in Southern California. So I grew up in Frederick myself as well. Lived in San Diego for about six years. It was such an awesome place for air-cooled 911s. I mean, the, you, there were so many great shops that could work on them. There was so, like, I had this thing that was out in the desert its whole life. It didn't have a square centimeter of rust in it anywhere. I love that car, it was in mint condition, spent a ton of money on it. Kids came, had to get rid of it. So I got a, a, a brand new, I ordered and did the track day pickup for a, a what is it? F85, a, t- a 2015 M3, which was the four door. Cause now I had a kid in a car seat, but I did get the manual in it. I, I do think everybody should own a four door manual car. It's a rear wheel drive. It's a lot of fun. And then I, I turned that in. I got a 2016 911 Carrera. I guess that was a 991.1. And I have a BMW X5 V8 for a family hauler, the not the M version. And my my fun car is behind me, 991.2 GT3 with a six-speed manual. Uh, you thought this was a, an image background behind me. It's not. It's my actual car. Um. <laughs> Which I'm, I'm sitting here looking at, like having anxiety over how close that is to the, the garage door from this angle. <laughs> I, I I've kind of was like a two-car person rotating cars around. I do think I've married that thing behind me. I just love it to death. <laughs> so I think I'm, I'm I'm with that one for a while, but I can I can get a lift and uh, I'll just put something uh, underneath it or above it or something. So in addition to that, you've actually done some autocross and track days with uh, PCA and some other groups, right? So you're not just a collector or a connoisseur. You've been on track as well. <laughs> a little bit. I, I do not, do not want to overrepresent my track experience at all. Yeah, I've done a couple of BMW uh, driving school events with the, with the the M3 side, you know, some autocross, but uh, I, I want to do more of the Porsche club. I actually have a neighbor out here who's pretty active in it as well. I want to do more in that space. For me, it's it's been a time thing. My job is tough and you've got little kids. So I'm hoping, you know, a little older, a little more independent and, you know, they can run around on a Saturday without harassing me all day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I, I, w- I would absolutely love to get to a track a few times a year now. And then hopefully when I'm a little older, do that more frequently. Since we've got a little bit of background into your car history and I, I know, and I know in talking with you, you have a, <laughs> you have a very good knowledge of cars and whatnot. And we kind of had a precursor conversation to this about cars of the nineties. And so, you know, as we get into our basically main event here, our what should I buy panel, you know, a bunch of us have come prepared with some options for you about going about and buying a nineties car. What we're really interested in is getting your shopping criteria, you know, what you're looking sure. for price range, some things you're not interested in, some things you may be interested, in, et cetera. So why don't you lay that out for the panel so we can better focus on some of our suggestions. Awesome. I think the panel will be fun because I love a lot of things and, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of open. So a couple things, right. I'm, I'm kind of OCD. So I want something that I can get in really that I doesn't have to get it in really good condition, but I have to be able to get it to really good condition. 
right? And so sometimes, you know, that can be harder with some of the older ones. I want to have a very nice car. And I'm, I'm fine with paying the money to get it there, but, but I like, you know, just clean and tight, no rattles, no, no excuses, really good shape. The, there are so many d- kind of different aspects of 90s car culture. I, you know, I, I loved all of it. I love the Japanese unobtainium that you played on a PlayStation 1, right? So I'm born in 81, so I'm in high school and graduated in 99. So, you know, kind of grew up through that, but I also grew up my entire life going to car shows, which was mostly American muscle. You know, I've, I've always thought about kind of different things that might be fun there. So I've really enjoyed, you know, the Japanese sports car side, the American muscle. I want something also that I can get pretty fast, right? I mean, not, not, not fast in a, in a zero to 60 time or fast in a, like a particular lap time, but I want something that can feel fast, overpower its traction for most of its gears and that you can be a general hooligan in. So we were like having that debate. Like to me, that kind of crosses out like a Ferrari 355. Although those things are probably, I'm not sure they're worth the price at this point. Super Um, unreliable too, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. Those generation V8s. I think one of the things I did enjoy about it that I should mention, like the idea of kind of customization and modification, right? So I'm not in this to get something, leave it bone stock and hopefully sell it you know, for some money later, I don't care if I'm devaluing it. I'm doing this for me. I'm not doing it as an investment or something, something stupid like that. So I I do, you know, (laughs) you know, this, this is a little bit of the 12 year old kid who had the 930 with the whale tail on the wall. And, and that's why I didn't get the touring package on my GT3. And I don't give a shit if the touring package was the cool thing to do. Uh, (laughs) It exactly. didn't have a giant. It didn't have a giant spoiler on the back, and my 930 poster did. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little juvenile. I don't care. I'm doing it for fun. I think that modification and customization part of it is definitely a part of that call culture that I that I yeah. really enjoyed. And I think you said something just to you know kind of round out this thought before we turn it over to the panel to start throwing up their suggestions. I think one thing that <laughs> was really almost prophetic in a way was when you and I were talking and you said, you know, looking back now on a car from the nineties is the same as when I was a kid looking back at some of those cars from the fifties and sixties, it's the same time gap. It's that same generational gap. And then it makes you feel super old when you realize that a nineties car is 30 years old at this point. Right. So pretty crazy. It, it is. You're, you're absolutely right. So, you know, growing up and I'm looking at American muscle in the late eighties and early nineties that's how old these cars are now. Right. And I'm going through with my dad and he's telling me about, you know, my dad owned a ton of muscle cars uh, back in the day. He, I grew up with him in quarter mile bikes were like his, our garage. We never had any cars in our two car garage. It was full of motorcycles. And so, you know, there was a lot of motorcycles, but he loved cars, you know, was always talking about the American muscle. And so, yeah, that, that, that epiphany, I, it was literally just kind of dawned on me one day. I'm like, wait a minute. I am the same distance from those cars now. It's a tribute to the quality of the cars that they're not all completely rotisserie restored like they were back then. They had right. to be because they'd fallen apart twice over by the time you got them to 1990. But, but at the same time, people are just starting to think about how do I restore this car? You're finding them still unrestored. I don't want to get into this 10 years later and the market is kind of already defined and I want to get in front of it and be able to do something before the market tells you what to do and, and people, yeah. you know, start kind of figuring it out. Let's shock the panel a little bit because you just slightly went there, but then didn't say what your budget was. Oh, and so from a price range, I think all in with like getting the car and, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do much work myself. Right. So I'm paying somebody to do work on it. I, yeah. So all in uh, call it a hundred grand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, this is this is the mission now. All right, car from the 90s, fully restored. It's got to be a hooligan car, 100 grand or less. How about we go to Mike? Well, so you mentioned having owned a, a Z28. If I you're... love Mustangs, by the way. I, I love Mustangs, but the Camaro had so much more power in that generation. I think you'd have to be a little silly to pick the, <laughs> the five well, liter stock. <laughs> if you're looking for that more muscle car look, I would actually pitch the, the Camaro's cousin. Specifically, oh, the, 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 the WS6. WS6, yes. WS6, yeah. I was always infatuated with those cars when they came out. They were, I mean, a friend of mine had a 92 Camaro, but it was only the the RS. But the Firebird WS6 with that big uh, evil Ram Air hood. Yeah. And the commercials remember, they had were, remember were hilarious. The, the evil commercial was awesome. And then they had, when it first came out, they had Chris Tucker driving one and one of his buddy cop movies. Like, 
you haven't seen Chris Tucker in a movie <laughs> in 25 <laughs> years. But the last one you saw him in, he's driving a WS6 around. So I had the opportunity to drive a stock one and I got to drive Mike Snyder's SCCA Pro Solo car. And Brad remembers that Trans Am. And I tell you what, when you mod a WS6 and you really straighten out that suspension and get it dialed in, that car is a handful, but it's also a hell of a lot of fun. So mad props to Mike on that suggestion. I actually hadn't even thought about the WS6. Yeah, the second he brought up Camaro, I'm like, ooh, you know, it just, it struck a memory of that car. And plus, since the WS6 went with the LS motor, you have the whole LS aftermarket to go. Oh, after. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, big, big yeah. turbos, big turbos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mine, mine was an LT1. It was prior to that, but yeah, towards the end, they dropped the LS in it. So um, it, is the GOAT an option as well? Or is that, no, the GOAT's later, right? So that's a 2000s car. So that won't work. 2003, 2003. Well, hang on, hang on. Okay. So this is a good point. This is a good point. You know, I guess this is up to me. I think some of the best cars from the 90s were made in the early noughties, right? They had matured it. They figured it out. Like the NSX you want is one of those last couple years. Yeah, that's years. true. I'll give you that. Yeah, yes. That's like the best car from the 90s. But yeah, sure. It's from 2002, but whatever. I don't care. Uh, I'm not picky, right? Your E39 M5s. There's a lot of really great. I think if you look at its contemporaries, at the time, in the early 2000s, they were like, ooh, you know, like, okay, yeah. it's still solid rear axle, it's still doing this, it's still doing that. You know, Mustang had that brief flirtation with independent rear suspension in the Cobras. But when you compare it to the 90s cars that it was the mature version of, I will totally I will totally accept early noughties cars, but it has to be representative of the 90s. It can't be like a... Uh, you know, like a 996 turbo or something, which is like cool, but that's definitely not a 90s yeah. car. I got you. I got you. So yeah. Mount Man Dan, since we're talking GM, Mount Man Dan. I, I'm on board with Mike's suggestion of the WS6. And for that particular one with the Ram Air was 98 to 02. So those were the years that they made that particular version of the WS6. And I'm all on board with that suggestion, Mike. Huge kudos for that. But a question I had for the budget is that number you threw out the initial purchase or does that include modifications? No, I, want, I want that to be, I want that to be all in, right? So it kind of excludes something like an R34 because it's not going to work, right? But you could do an R32 and restore it and build it up. And you could do a really great, super powerful car for that kind of money. If that's, if that's what you wanted to do, I, I don't mean to make anyone go discuss. I will not do an Impala SS. I'll tell you that. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I but this do. is the wagon. This is it, the it wagon. Is the, what about the Callaway? It is the wagon. So you don't want to you don't want to drive an upside down bathtub. Is what you're saying. <laughs> Dax, I, Dax I think Shepard I think has the problem. The, the the problem was well, that I think the problem is is that the SS was really cool for grown ass adults in the nineties. I wasn't a grown ass adult, so I'm thinking of something that I thought of as cool in my more formative years, of which absolutely the WS six. Well, if we're, if we're still talking GM, then, you know, we, we were actually debating this internally and it was like C4 Corvette or C5 Corvette. And I'm like, well, the C4 Corvette, the only one in the nineties is any good as a ZR1. And it's still a C4 Corvette at that point. So what about the C5 Vet Z06 as an example? Z06 well, didn't come out until 2001. I mean, I could, if he's talking about his nineties cars, yeah. Yeah. Early 2000s. So the, I, so I wonder if the C5 is maybe the inverse of my prior rule. So my prior rule being like, you could take a mature car that, you know, stretched into the noughties. But if you had, I think of the C5 as a noughties car that came out a Started couple of years early, early yeah. right? And so, you know, not as much. Do you my, have enough chest hair to drive a Corvette? <laughs> yes, I'm, I am. I am, New Balance. I have, if I didn't shave, I would have hair from like here down to my ankles. So it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, so I will say, because as since we're on American cars, I have two problems, which I'm going to have to figure out how to get over if I'm going to do it. One is a solid rear axle. And two are the interiors suck. And like, particularly, you know, like a, a C4, even a C5 Corvette, like I look at the inside of them and I want to throw up. And the funny thing is, is like, I, you know, I'm not, I don't mean to be German biased. I love American cars, but like you can look at an 85, 325 BMW and it's a nice, clean, minimalist interior that, this is totally damn reasonable today. Like you can look at it 40 years later. It's totally fine. And you look at like what Americans are doing in the eighties and they have these crazy LCDs, like it all looks like night riders animations yeah. and giant blobular buttons and like some kind of weird sci-fi fighter cockpit interpretation. I struggle with it a bit. I, I'm going to be totally honest. I, I really, and the worst that had a C4 and yeah, that giant 
green bar that went up oh, and then God. across the dashboard. The, the cheap plastic, the thin, thin little crowd, cheap plastic, the buttons. Oh, well, well even the C5, you think you're in a trailblazer. You're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> no offense to the Corvette owners. I'm just saying it's not the best until the C6s and 7s when they got their act together. I mean, it was not the best of interiors, but Mountain Man Dan, you had a comment. John been saying that basically they were made with such cheap plastic that if you find something where something inside's not broken, that's a diamond in the rough. Because whether it be the mounting for, spot for the switches or something, they always broke. But one thing I was going to ask is if we're going for sports stuff and something that was quick, I'm going to throw this out there. It's not a car. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. What about like the Typhoon or the Cyclone? The Typhoon, you can still throw it in Oh, I love those ideas. I love those ideas. I so, they were fast as could be up until recently for trucks from the factory. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they did a four and a half seconds, zero to 60 on the GMC Cyclone. And that thing, that record lasted until like like the last Raptor or something. I mean, it was crazy. So yeah, I, I love the Cyclone idea. I think that's a ton of fun. I believe that had the Grand National motor in it. 3.8 um, turbo. Yeah, that 3.8 turbo, the intercooler. So I, I love I love the Grand I love the Grand National. Uh, I love that motor. That realizing the Grand National is a little 80s, but that's a great way to bring that power plant into the 90s. So yeah, so, no, I love that. The, the Grand National was a 3.8, and the Cyclone and the Typhoon were 4.3. I thought like, they were 3.8s. They were the same motor. motor. Did they just you like bore or stroke the motor? Or was it a different power plant? Yeah. The 4.3, the easiest way to explain it is a 350 missing two cylinders. The, uh, okay. And everything is just six instead of eight cylinders. And even like front components and everything bolt up the same one of the 4.3 off of the 350. I, I see Mike is fact checking. Oh, we're Googling. Oh, Mike's now. always he's fact checking. Us right now. We're Googling. <laughs> it is the 4.3. He is right. Oh, wow. He's dead. Okay. Of course he's right. It's about, <laughs> about a GM. You can't, you can't argue with a mountain man. I got to finish this Chevy conversation and just get us off that train before we go down a road. We don't ever, we can't ever get back from. That's true. It'll become a Chevy episode. I'm going to go with the 3000 GT. I like that. It's my personal favorite. Everybody says the Supra or the RX-7, which yes, they're on my list as well. But the first time I ever saw a 3000 GT in a parking lot, I was like, oh my God, that is a beautiful Ferrari. I had no idea. I was like 12 (laughs) years old or whatever. I don't fucking know. Save yourself some money. Get a stealth. It was I was red. thinking the same thing. It's just beautiful. It's just a good looking car. All wheel drive. I, you can get the VR4. You can I, turbo I, the hell out of them. I love this idea. As a kid, you read the car magazines, which I read religiously. My parents couldn't get me to read a religious text, but I would read Car and Driver and Motor <laughs> Trend every month that it came to my house. And they would always do the big three comparison, right? The 300ZX, which is another car that was a 90s car, but came out in 89 or whatever, right? A little before its time. It's huge. Right, but they'd like a 300 ZX, a Mark IV, 3000 GT VR4 twin, you know, turbos and everything, an RX7. And they do the comparison, and I always wanted the VR4 to win because I thought it was the coolest looking car of the group by a mile, and it always got its ass kicked. It was always the fastest in Gran Turismo, though, the GTO. (laughs) Oh my god, but it it would like always lose because it was so fat. The car weighed like 800 pounds more than all of its competitors. But it's supposed to be a great GT car. It's supposed to drive really well. It's supposed to be a great driver's car. I, I, I definitely like that idea. I wonder if the Dodge Stealth is a little bit of a uh, of a sleeper choice from a perspective of, you know, kind of not what people are expecting. I don't think it's as pretty, particularly the late model VR4s, right? So that's a late one you show. Yeah. And, you know, because they went away from the pop-up headlights, I think in 98, if I remember. Obviously not. Yeah, this stock, is a 98. Not a stock. Or 97. Either. Not a stock intercooler on that. But yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I love them. The only thing that worried me about the VR4s is if you've ever seen one under the hood, it's transverse. That's the disadvantage I thought it always had against the 300ZX or the Supra or whatever. Mm-hmm. Those being a classic, you know, front mount rear drive layout. The VR4 was just like, uh, so, okay. So you wonder if in post-life and in modification if you could help it get past that like because you're right it's a front wheel biased all-wheel drive system it because of that it's also got a lot of weight up front so the weight distribution isn't great isn't it like if you change the the gear ratio a little bit between the front and the back like that's what they did with like the focus rs where it was just like like a you know a few percent faster in the back it puts a lot of pressure on the clutch in the middle but it causes the power to go to the rear. Right. Uh, and, and and you can kind of fix that bias in the in the all-wheel drive system that way. But like again, 
because nobody's really gotten into these cars yet, we're just starting to get into this trend of 40 year olds having money and deciding they're going to dump it into this pit of car modification and whatever restoration. I don't think people have really figured that out yet. Like you don't see any great, well-documented path. The only problem I have with the Japanese cars in this era is that we've already listed 80% of the good ones, right? Because if you, if you look, I mean, outside of the RX-7 and all the ones that we've already mentioned, there's a couple Sylvia's, there's some other cars that we didn't get and things like that that were Japanese only, but there wasn't a whole lot of JDM offerings in the U.S. that were really that awesome. Oh God, Brad just put one the up. The Quaalude. <laughs> oh, just for Brian, just for Brian Shod. Yeah, because he's listening. Like, to, he's listening to this screaming. What about the prelude? And I'm like, <laughs> there you go. But I don't the know how much. I don't know how much hooning you can do with that, unless you can front wheel drive. You got it's like 170 horsepower or 200 in the SH. Yeah, the, the, SH. the SH. I remember at the time that they made such a deal like that has a laser that measures the suspension and adjusts. It's ridiculous. Was that the one with the four wheel steering, or was it the Mitsubishi? Yep, that? four wheel steering, four wheel yeah. passive steering. Was did they have the four wheel steering in that generation? I know they did in the in the generation prior. I yeah, they, I believe did it was in this generation as well. Type yeah. R Integra, like if you're throwing this up yeah. there, like yeah, that's a, that's a 2000, 2001 car, but that's like the pinnacle of nineties. You can't get too much power out of those though. I or mean, the Civics, the Civic Type I mean, R's from that. That's period. just the money problem. Damn. Too much power. You just got to build this shit out of the motor. Well, yeah, and this, all the skylines, right? And the R32s and 33s, I've been talking to some people, the 33s are becoming really popular because they were unwanted to begin with. The joke I heard was the R32 skyline is the one you took to the track. The R34 is the one you took to the shows and the drag races. And the R33 was the one you bought your wife. But when I look at the R33, it's kind of indicative of the 90s design in general. It's just kind of this Mobius marshmallow on wheels. Like they're all kind of look the same after a while. But the one car it brings to my attention and I thought of, and it's on my list, and it's kind of the same car, but in, in two different trims, the Toyota Soarer, which is also the Lexus SC400. All right. Right. So you can hoon the hell out of that thing because it's basically a 2JZ, just like a Supra. Right? Well, so the SC300 is, and then you do a 2JZ swap. The SC400 was the V8. V8. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But you get- so, so yeah, I think, I think the Lexus SC is a great option to, to think about, right? That could be a lot of fun. And they had a manual that you could get with them. That would absolutely be really interesting, I think. And you're not paying the super tax either, right? You can have the same car, slightly larger, put your kids in it. It's a bit of a sleeper. If you think about it in comparison, you could make 900 horsepower at that 2JZ pretty easily. There's a flip side to the super tax though, which is like the super tax is the, the super is, is really the only one that is like really, I think really completely mature in regards to like, they've absolutely figured out every corner of that car. You can get reliably a ton of horsepower out of it. You know, it's going to fail when, you know how to make it work. There are no rabbit holes left or quests to, you know, Don Quixote type things to try and figure out. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I've definitely been looking on eBay or, or auto trade or whatever and be like, I could just buy this guy's $150,000 car for 80 grand. And you know, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> and, and, but then yeah. that's somebody else's build. I mean, exactly, right? But like, you know, you're you're getting it for 50 cents on the dollar. And yeah, you go in and you fix whatever you got to fix to get it sorted out. It's not going to be perfect when you get it by any means. You'll certainly save a lot of money going into it that way. Buy somebody else's money pit and then get it sorted. So what is the goal intent for the vehicle? Is it going to be something you street, something you track? Great, great question. I don't see it being a racetrack car. So maybe, maybe quarter mile, not to see that I'm like trying to, you know, make a nine second car or something, but like, I think, I think it might be fun to take out the quarter mile, but yeah, no, I mean, mainly street drive around, have fun, cars and coffee take, type take, take the kids somewhere, go to cars and coffee, remind them what cars used to be like my kids. I mean, not cars and coffee. They know. Um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and ha- just have some fun. Hooligan is, I believe the word I picked at the beginning. True. I'm going to throw it out there. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be good for carrying the kids around, but a 240SX, there's a ton you can do with those. I loved those. And the, and the little Infinity variant of that, I forget what they called it, a G20 or something maybe. Yeah, that 240 and the Infinity version, absolutely. Be well, the problem is for hundred grand, he can buy about 37 of those because they ain't worth a damn. So, <laughs> But they're all missing their front bumpers because they fell off at the drift circuit. Yeah, 100%, <laughs> right? Because- like- <laughs> They, those are the ones they slow. They put the solid axles in. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's a four three oh two under the hood. The two forty. The problem is they're so expensive because the guys drifting them. They've all totaled them and wrecked them and destroyed them. But if you do wind up with a two forty, I just happen to have a body kit. Ooh, around. that's fun. <laughs> he said, rolling his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, going back to a uh, good old American car that fully fits the criteria. It's, it's at least not the 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 earliest in '95. So the 1999 Ford Mustang Cobra, which was the first year of the more squared off design. So that's a SN95, right? But then there's it's an also SN95 with the new body. There's also the '93 Cobra SVT, which is the last of the Fox bodies. So you kind of have it on both ends of the '90s, right? Depending on what you're into. But even if you buy a Fox body, I think you're in the same camp that like Bobby Parks is in. You throw the 302 in the trash and you put an LS in it and built like a 1200 horsepower monster. Well, but at least that one, the, the Cobra specifically comes with the independent rear. That's true. No, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. That's a, that is a great car. I think it looks really cool. I think it's a great option. I do like that it has independent rear suspension and, and that it's it's gotten it. It's funny how they went away from that later, right? In the later uh, GT500s, they, they put the solid axle back in. It's a good move by Ford, in my opinion. Racer Ron's on the panel. Do we want to get some input from him? So um, I think you guys have a lot of really great ideas. You're throwing a lot of good stuff out there. The situation is balanced between how nice a machine you can get up front it's not totally wrecked like a, a 240 is going to be trash period i mean they just and a, and a lot of the stuff all, you get from japan is trash used, too right it just is they're all used up so that's totally out of the picture but sticking with american iron is not a bad way to go from a lot of perspectives you know the least of them being you can usually find someone to actually work on um, without true. spending a hell of a lot of money because the supras that's a specialty guy you know bmw guys are never real cheap but doesn't sound like you're really going to go the BMW direction. So I, I would well, definitely be thinking about American. <laughs> I mean, that, that, I would definitely be thinking strong about American Iron. I like the GT3000. I think it's a good car. I think the, the W Series are also good cars. They're complicated, though, and they're not cheap to work on either. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's a tough call. You, you can do real well for really cheap with the Cobra. I mean, there's no there's no two ways about it. You save yourself some money for another toy. You just buy a couple of them. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, the Isuzu V-Cross is one that you should totally do. <laughs> Negative. <laughs> oh, wait, no, the, the, one, the other one I brought up in chat is the Monte Carlo SS Tasmanian Devil Edition. Oh, God. Oh, God. Hey, what the hell? <laughs> they they made that. Is that like so, the Bugs Bunny Venture Van thing that yes. they did? Oh. It, it Why was, don't you it, just tell me to get the Dale Earnhardt edition? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so they had both the Dale Earnhardt, more of the Dale Earnhardt ones. They had the Intimidator, and then they had the Dale Jr. edition, and then they had the Tasmanian right. Devil edition. Okay, we've talked about Americans. We talked about Japanese. You alluded to some Italians there at the beginning. Let's talk about the Italians for a second. The Fiat Panda. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, for sure, hundred percent. That's that's a winner. You know, F three fifty five. I mean, as good looking and evolution of the three series as they are. They have a horror story, you know, nightmare reputation behind them for reliability. But there's a couple other Italians behind that same era that I think are better. Maybe as a sleeper, if you're thinking about going in that direction, what about the Maserati 3200 GT? Precursor to the coupe. Is that the evolution of the bi-turbo? Was it like the same chassis and setup? Or? Negative. So it's it's the swoopy one that kind of looks like an Aston or a Jag, which later become the coupe and then like the current body style that it's now. It's like the beginning of that lineage. So they sold 27 of them in the United States? I, I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking of finding somebody to work on. No, I mean, actually, I don't know anything about that car. It wasn't on my radar. So it sounds really interesting. I like the idea of, of learning about that. I really don't know much about it, you know, which is, I don't have too many gaps, but that's definitely one of them. I also don't know any shit about French cars from the 90s either. Don't bother. It's not worth it. <laughs> I was going to say, just pack a lot of wine and cheese for when you're broken down on the side of the road if you buy French. Yes. So Brad has a picture Wait, of it's it. That? There in the back. It's that. Because they made that car up until like 2008. I know because I lived in San Diego it and got everyone drove one. It got renamed to the Coupe. And so originally it was the 3200 GT. And so that's, that's what it is. It's the precursor to those, you know, what we know now to be kind of the current, you know, lineage of Maseratis. 
but so, there's another. So, so that was like the so that was like the early Gran Turismo of today. Correct. Yeah, it, those things were so popular in San Diego. You could pick that car up like four or five years old with 25,000 miles on it for 20 grand. Exactly. It's a bargain, <laughs> really. I mean, and it's a Ferrari power plant and all the fun stuff that goes along with that, but it's not a Ferrari, right? So yeah, I don't, yeah I don't we're going to put air quotes around it. I don't, it, I don't know about the one in the, I don't know. I mean, did they make a manual with it? Because later they didn't. And they only had a single clutch. Correct. Uh, automated, you know, pseudo manual. And that clutch was seven grand to replace. Oof. And it went out about every 6,000 miles. And I know because my boss had one. And, and, and does that fun very, very does really. that fun stuff with the Ferrari engine include removing the engine from the car every like five thousand miles to completely rebuild it? No, no, the fun stuff is open pipes, so you could really hear it sing. That's yeah, what I no, I mean, don't get me wrong. The sound was great. So my boss had had one of those, although it was like a two thousand eight or whatever. But the sound was great. The intake noise was a ton of fun. Like I, I love like you could hit the gas and you just heard it sounded like an angry dragon was sucking in air, and it was really cool. So the, the engine was great. It's fat. It is a, it is a big, it is bigger than it looks. Like yes, a lot of cars agree. are the other way around. That thing is bigger than it looks and it weighs like 4,200 pounds. Speaking of bigger than it looks and also coming from Italy, how about the 550 Maranello? You can't get those for hundred grand anymore. I would love to get one. And, 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 and if I was smart, I would, instead of buying this, would have bought a 550 Maranello for hundred grand. It'd be worth 200 grand a day. You cannot find a good 550 for hundred grand anymore. If we can, please point me in the direction. But, yeah, but right? the 550s were cool because they were manual only, which I actually think is why the, the values have gone up so much as opposed to like a 456 or something else. 55 or whatever, yeah. The 550 was only that six-speed gated and the, the valuations have literally doubled in like the last four years. It's crazy. Damn. I see it. What is that? An RS6? A 90s RS6? It's a five-turbo oh, S4. Five S4. Oh, okay. Five-turbo. Yeah. You can get I a ton do. of power out of them. Not very reliable, but they're... You see, it's fun so to look at. Out, fast. Audi, Audi was still in the doghouse in the 90s. So it was a huge gap for me. I only knew one person who whose family had an Audi and they, they weren't in the car magazines. They like they were just, you know, you'd read about you'd read about AMGs, you'd read about M cars, but like Audi just didn't exist until the noughties. It was like it just yeah. disappeared and then came back. When I was in high school, I knew one person who had an Audi and his entire family had about 50 of them. And he's in that other screen up there. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. We've had way too many. We, we lived through the 90s Audis, man. But, you know, speaking of that, since we're talking about Audis right now, it makes sense to bring up the S8 from Ronin. That's a late 90s car. And it's also a sleeper. You know, we're talking. Cool. That's a great idea. I love you guys. That suggestion made this whole thing worth it. I love that idea. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm going to do it definitively, but like I wasn't even thinking about that dinner curry. I love Ronin. I mean, you know, all this cool uh, double clutching was in a Peugeot, I think, but whatever. Yeah, great idea. Love it. Put some yeah, and those cars that. back then, you're talking somewhere, you know, south of 400 horsepower, but it's easy to untap the 4.2 and get more power out of it. Well, well hang really? on real quick, as we're, as we're going down this path with the, with the Audis, what, what about some engine swaps? I, I've been kind of kicking around some ideas, right? Like, what if I put the E39 M5 motor, which I, pardon me, I forget the designation, S62 or something. I don't remember the E39 M5 motor, but like put that in an 840. I think there might be an opportunity to create, because I do want something that's kind of unique. I think there might be some fun ideas around, around doing something like that. I'm wondering if you guys have any that's cr Pandora's cr box. Cr that. crazy, crazy thoughts on thematically appropriate engine swaps, right? So like one of the coolest cars I think I've ever seen is an original 240Z, like a 1971 or two or whatever that had a Skyline, like a mm -hmm. like an R33 inline six dropped in it, right? And it's like, here it is kind of, you know, four generations later of that motor of the original inline six in there. Obviously not for a 90s car, but like what, what do we think might be a, a thematically cool engine swap type idea? It's probably not a popular opinion. A lot of people call it a hairdresser's car, but I actually like the 8 Series. It was on my list as well as one of my like top three series. suggestions. I definitely like the 8 Series. I, I, was, I was so disappointed as a kid that how slow they were because they looked so fast. They looked badass. <laughs> they I mean, looked so cool. And then they were like not actually fast. Even the V12 was just kind of like, why did you put a V12 in it if that's all it's going to do? And there's three different motor packages for the V12. There's like a 5.0, a 5.4, and a 5.6 or something like that. So if you're going to get one, you get the later mm. one because at least they figured it out. And you get slightly more horsepower. So <laughs> so be it. The biggest problem that the uh, V12s ran into was the early V12s were nothing but two six-cylinders 
and the failure points were enormous. Like the throttle bodies were fifteen hundred dollars a piece, and oh. they failed in pairs. They failed in pairs, were, which apparently was bad. <laughs> You know, the, the one thing you hadn't mentioned, you're talking about Audis and, you know, the A8 and the A8L were neat cars, but I had probably the more advanced version of that because of the time period and the technology, which was the original Audi V8. They were, from a technology standpoint, amazing, but, you know, they also used probably some of the worst technology ever available. <laughs> well, let's make a V8 by taking two 16 valves and putting them together, right? I mean, it's a kind of, that's what they were doing back then because I don't it's know what, why. It's what, it's what Ford did to Aston Martin, right? They, yeah, as soon exactly. as they bought them, they're like, here, take this Ford Taurus and times it by two. If we're still talking about the Audis, I mean, like to Brad's point, I mean, we grew up at one point, I think we had three coupe quattros, right? But that was the beginning of the 90s. So that was the beginning of the round period, right? Where it's like, okay, here's a marshmallow and, and four wheels. So those yeah. early Audis kind of all look the same, you know, the 90 CS Sport, the, the Quattro, all that kind of stuff, even the 100, they weren't anything to write home about, but it's not until you got to the B5 S4 or to the S8, where it kind of, they started to change their mind and start to go in an aggressive direction. And then, you know, Audi now is, is 180 out from there again. So I think there's some cool stuff there. It's just a matter of digging deeper and seeing what you can do. So to Eric's point, I've got your car for you right now. All right, let's do it. It's an Audi Coupe Quattro. It's in Eric's garage right now. It's got a motor swap. It's already done. It's true. It just needs some TLC. He'll sell it to you for a hundred grand right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is an S8 motor in there, so it's four hundred yep. horse, and it was featured in European Car for anybody that's listening many many years ago. So, wow. so it's a famous car too. Look at that. That's true. Yeah, original, original one off. Original six speed. Does it, does it cut? Do you have original? You have the. Do you have the magazine article? Like, uh, yeah. You have, there you go. Yep. Well, that was the only one that ran in the country, if I recall. That's true. And then we did a UR Quattro with a 3.6 swap from the car that Matt was talking about, the original V8 Quattro. So we had two kind of unicorns. At but the that other car is no longer available, but he's still got the one for sale, 100 grand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take offers, 100%. $5. <laughs> but, you know, since we talked about Audi and, you know, we, we've, we've touched on some cars that might be unreliable, let's talk about British cars for a minute. And Brad flashed up the Esprit. So what do you think about that? I loved those cars when I was a kid. I, there was I think no getting problem. a lot of power yeah. out of them is the problem. There was nothing cooler. Was that V8 any good? I know it was like a 3.5 liter twin turbo V8. No, I, the I transmission to... was the best part of that car. You're going to swap the transmission in French? It. No, it was out of a Mondeo, apparently. <laughs> the Mondeo gets a bad rap. And it really wasn't a bad car. They love the Mondeo on old Top Gear. They 100%. talked about the They talked about the Mondeo like it was the greatest family car you could ever buy. Oh, it was everywhere in Germany, too. Because you did a billion things to it, and we called it the Jaguar X-Type in this country. Yes. Yeah. Or the SVT Contour, which the SVT Contour was a, was a surprisingly <laughs> nice car. In fact, I have a friend who has one that's 200,000 miles on it, original clutch. And they were neat cars. I mean, they were small cars, too. But, you know, remember that this is in a time period when a big car was with a five series. Yeah. And what's five series size today? It's like a it's like yeah, a three. You're, series. You're, yeah. that, that I always said about my F82 or 85 M3 that I bought the 2015 M3 that I bought. It was the E39. I always wanted that generation of three series is bigger than that 90s five series. You know, and and it was like this is this is the M5 that I want. Of course, the M5 now is a boat. <laughs> oh, I, so, and so I'm just buying the M3. But well, since we're talking about engine swaps, the Brits are pretty famous for jamming weird motors in kind of just normal cars, and that's why I wanted to bring up and talk about the Brits because the answer here in America is LS swap the world. We already know that, so there's no other swap over to do. there. It's the Land Rover V8 and, L, yeah, and yeah, all right. the things. <laughs> but I came across two cars and the, and the Land Rover. No, tell us, tell us. What about the Land Rover? The Land Rover V8 sucks. <laughs> There's nothing to write home about because it's nothing but the 3.9 redone. The, and the later ones, the 4.4s and the 4.6s are BMW motors, which is fine. But they're BMW motors. Yeah, you I know? think, I I think mean, they use, I think that, they use them over the there simply that, because that's what they have available. That's very true. So speaking of cars that have BMW motors swapped into them <laughs> from the factory, and this is why I wanted to bring up British cars, what about the Bentley Arnage, which came with a 4.4 liter turbocharged BMW engine or the optional six and three quarter liter turbo? And that's another sleeper. 
I'm not sure I have the patience to own one of those cars in the sense that it's going to spend at least six months out of the year in the shop, you know, yeah. and then looking at the gap of my garage, more, more days than it's filled would be difficult because <laughs> you're going to be waiting for parts forever. So the other one I came up on the Brit list and they are famous for this is Jaguar. Um, <laughs> we are talking Jags. I drive a Jag. And it's the XJR with the supercharged four liter. It makes 370 horsepower, zero to 60 in 5.6 seconds and electronically limited to 155 miles an hour. I think that car is kind of cool because it's understated. It's a Jag. You're like, ah, it's a Jag like anything else, but it's going to put you in your place from traffic light to traffic light. Yeah, I think the XJR is great. The, the old XKs, I mean, it still kind of looks like an 80s car, but man, you just, you look at that. That's, that's such, I, I still think it's such a cool looking car. And I don't know when they came out with a more modern looking XK. That might have been like 99 or something. No, I mean, I think Jags, they're so good looking. And in the 90s, I think you still get some of that authentic British uh, cigar library type feel to it. Whereas like by the 2000s, that, that's turned into some cartoonish caricature of itself. The XJR was a sleeper too, because like the M5, you really had to look at it to notice the difference. Exactly. And that's why I brought that car up. I think it's a fantastic option if you're looking for a sleeper that you can hoon around in. No one will expect that Jag to be able to put that kind of power down and being supercharged, turn the wick up to 11 and see what happens, right? Put some pulleys on it, bigger intercoolers, see what you can do. When you're speaking of like the cars from either England or Europe in general, the little thing that I was doing a while back, is if you go on to like ebay.co.uk, which is England's eBay, you go in there and look for the car you're interested in. And then shipping it over here, even buying it at their price and shipping it, you're still in it for less than half of what people here states I would be selling the same car. So I've spent a lot of time in London for work. I have to spend a bunch of time at Canary Wharf and the, um, the used car values are so low. It's crazy how cheap because they're so afraid of gasoline prices. So the crazy asshole buys it new because they love the car and they don't care how much they're going to pay for petrol and 80 billion pounds per English gallon or whatever. They don't care. But then used is worth nothing. Absolutely. And so I had some coworkers that repatriated, you know, patriated over there, immigrated. I, we should just say immigration. I think that's, they're immigrants. The, the, but the point being is that they, uh, they're over there now and they love the cars. Like they're they're buy they they're so excited about all the crap they can buy and how cheap it is. You're absolutely right. That's a great that's a great thought. Buying it and shipping it from there is still cheaper. Now you end up with a right hand drive car, particularly with now you're shifting stick left handed. Certainly, I'm ambidextrous. I don't know about you when it comes to shifting. <laughs> that's, that's kind of that's kind of like a bad too. I'd like to bring up another car. Can we introduce another another mark? Absolutely, Ron. Go ahead. Panos. I have that on my list, the Esperante. Esperante, man. I mean, out of the box, hauls ass, gorgeous car, and it's made with American iron. It is a modular Ford under under the hood. Right? Yep. So. so I just wanted to bring it up because I, I love those cars. They're they're just beautiful cars. Pull a picture up, Brad. I haven't I don't think I've seen one of these. Uh Esperante. Made in made in Georgia. You need to find one of Brett's disassembled one. <laughs> the nice thing about the five liter Ford is if you can't add power to a five liter Ford, you should really give up. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's like a small block Chevy. I mean, that's a good looking car. Today. We haven't it talked is. about we haven't talked about TV. That makes me think of the TVRs. Yes, that was on my list. The Cerbera. Like the, Cer the Cerbera yeah, was was Cerbera. so hot in video games. Um, even so, even some of one. you know what some of the '80s TVRs look like '90s cars. They were always so far ahead of their time and being out there, uh, you know, fiberglass crazy assholes that they were i think tv that's a really fun option i've been thinking so much i've been trolling jdm sites about like buying something to japan i'm importing it over and like i haven't even been looking at the uk and that could be a lot of fun and you can get skylines from the uk as well and they're a lot cheaper than getting them from japan a lot of people don't realize that so you know, we don't mention morgan of <laughs> I mean, I mean, they've looked the same since like 1920, right? So I mean, can you so just... so they they make that they they, are, they made they the, in the wooden. 90s they had that Ford. So of course they have the three wheeler. No thanks, but they made that the Arrow they made forever in the they had that in the 90s and back then it was still wood frame, which yep. assuming it well, hasn't been made... eaten out or something might be interesting. No, but they they made an Arrow which was different because the Morgan like four four and four eight or whatever the hell they were, those were the classic look. 
that Arrow 8 or whatever the hell it was, it, it was almost like a cartoon when they redid the body. It, it was, was like a cartoon gangster car. Yeah, exactly. It's it across yeah, yeah, from, yeah. from Prohibition. Like if, if somebody from Prohibition smoked, did some LSD or something, and then we're like, yeah, we're going to see this. <laughs> well, Brad just threw up a suggestion. What you got was- there, Brad? The the Shelby I thought they didn't make one. this car. They didn't. Did they make this car? I I've seen, seen one in person at an autocross. Re- yeah, but they only made like five. I remember watching a documentary. I remember watching a show in the '90s where Shelby was doing donuts in that car. Probably that yeah. exact same car. He was still alive, older than hey, dirt. Hey, we had a guy here who had a. He owned a do-it-yourself garage, and he had the Shelby one. Two hundred and forty-nine were built. 249 that's more nice that's a lot more than i thought that's really yeah, that cool. is. it was 80k new if i remember correctly from my childhood i've seen one in person though they're slick i so, mean but it, so, it doesn't so, look too different than the painos though in all in all no i think it, they were competitors Here, here's something we haven't thought about you know what else blew up in the 90s in car culture kit cars yes cobra kit car like I've, i keep looking at cobra kits one of my coworkers has a great backdraft with a BMW 3 Series suspension in it. So it's independent rear, multi-league front, and Ford racing crate motor in it. Oh, man, I, it's the then you're just you're just taking a car that may have come out in the 90s, but it's based off a car from like the 60s. It is, it, but but it's definitely a more. It, it is certainly an interpretation of it, though. It, it is not that you know that that original car, but that was just such a craze, right? And you remember, you remember walking around as a kid, you'd see these kit cars like everywhere. Like you don't see too many Cobra kits out on the road. I, I remember back then you used to see them all the damn time. There's also the, the Ferrari kit cars that were built off the yeah, Fieros. The yeah, Lamborghini, the that. Countach off the Fiero. I think Dan's got one buried in his property somewhere. Oh my God. Yet. Not yet. Oh my God. That's terrible. So since we're still sort of talking about British cars, there's one that we've probably forgotten about, which I happened to stumble across, which was the Aston DB7. The first really modern looking gorgeous. Correct. Aston. Correct. The, the, the Aston Martin Jaguar XJ, yeah. Understated, underappreciated, probably mostly forgotten at this point because of the DB9 and the DB9S and all the successors. An affordable 90s car. If you're looking for something quasi exotic. If, if you can find one with a manual in it. That, wasn't that a, a supercharged six cylinder? I believe it was. I think the DB7 was the first time they put the Ford Taurus V6s together and made the V12. Yeah, but I thought they had a straight six DB7. I think I'd have to go back and double check, but there's all yeah. these, there's always those packages and swap outs. The Brits that love doing that, like, oh, we created a body and let's jam another motor in it, you know, call it something else. I have a memory of them selling DB7s pretty well. In fact, I remember that being the first time I actually really saw people driving an Aston Martin. You'd have to go down to Potomac or somewhere where there were rich people but like not certainly not in frederick that was the first quote-unquote new aston martin and how long since, since the lagonda i think it was the war <laughs> yeah, well yeah yeah well that was that's always been the british philosophy why invent something new when you can continue to use what you've been doing for 50 years gotta put a dodge caravan up there huh the ultimate 90s car a brand new hellcat red eye Yes, because it is a 1998 Mercedes E class with a 900 horsepower V8 in it. Is everything AMG wanted to do in the 90s but couldn't? Why have we not talked about the Pontiac Sunfire? I just want to know. It reminds me of the Chevy Cavalier. I would, I would love to get a Pontiac Sunfire. Pontiac Sunfire. I did have a 1989 Chevy Cavalier first car, but I would love to get one just to pour gasoline on it and light it on fire. And what will you do with the remaining $99,550 <laughs> to spend? Yeah. <laughs> Something <laughs> else. <laughs> well, I'm going to throw it out there. What is it? The uh, Volvo C70, I think it was. I like those from the Saints. Or, or the, yeah. the, so- the Sobs. Like, yeah, you can't ignore Volvos and Sobs. Yeah, you can. <laughs> When did when did when did the A50R come out? Was that 2000 or 2001? I don't know. I feel like it was kind of a 90s. No, the 850, well the 850R maybe, but the 850 turbos, those were out in the 90s. Yeah. And they look exactly like that Dodge Caravan. I had one. I had a I had a 1995 850T5R. It was only for one year cuz the R's are only the first and second year. Fantastic car. I loved it. Well, that was probably the absolute first Volvo in like what 30 years that was not 
you know, the V1800 was a cool car. Yeah, I agree. You know, then what'd you end up with? 240 and a 242, you know? Look, look at us drive boxes and they're safe. And they're fast. Those are fast yeah, as well, well, man. And you're talking about motor swaps is, you remember the car that Paul Newman drove? It was a 740 with a five liter Ford because it fits. Yeah, that's true. That was pretty cool. They drove that car on uh, an episode of uh, Seinfeld's Comedians, Cars and Coffee with like David Letterman has one as well that Paul Newman built for him. It's a it's a cool sleeper. And if you go back to your engine swap thing, I think Matt's right on it. I mean, it's like a Volvo make it 400 horse with a Ford crate motor in it. That's kind of cool, actually. Oh, Brad's on to something. I'm going in that direction. So let's talk about Germans. Get a hammer. That would be great. I could do a hammer tribute. That would be a lot of fun. Well, I was thinking Brabus. Pick yourself up a Brabus Mercedes because people have forgotten about those cars. And that's a precursor to the AMGs that we're used to today. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think by the 90s, AMG had definitely, Brabus was the the underdog by that point. AMG had really blown up. But no, I, I think the thing that's hard to appreciate though is they they really, the, the volumes were so low like on those. They're genuinely, genuinely hard to find. But I agree. I think that's a great idea. Problem, of course, Mercedes never put a manual on anything. True, true. Um, they, they did, but only in the 190E. Yeah, or the diesels or something crazy. Hold on, but before we go there, so manual is a requirement? I won't say that it is a requirement. I'm pretty open, but it, it, there, there's going to have to be some real compelling things that bring me in. I, I mean, I love that car behind you. I love those wheels. God, those are so cool. This is the 500E with the Porsche uh, drivetrain. Yeah, the ones that Porsche did the drivetrain or something on. Yeah. I, yeah, I, lo- I love that car. I think that's a very fun idea right there. But that just makes you a European taxi cab driver. I don't care. You know what? No one in Carroll County knows what a European taxi cab driver drives. I guarantee you. That's true. I'll give you that. <laughs> that's very bad. taxi cabs. Why, about, why not a Crown Vic? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. I was going to say no Impala SS, no Mercury Marauder. They're both great cars. I don't want one. <laughs> well, the real, the real sleeper Mercedes is not the 500E, but the 400E. Because that was a 300E with a V8. Oh, interesting. So it looked just like the 300E, except it happens to have a V8 in it. They were nice cars. They weren't as exclusive as the 500, but they also weren't nearly as pricey or as, not finicky, but just fragile isn't even the right word. When stuff breaks in a 500E, you just kind of bend over. (laughs) With a 400E, a lot of it's just off the shelf for safety. Which I guess could be the same about the SL, right? So the SL500, I always thought was a gorgeous car. But to your point, doesn't come in a manual. I guess one of the criteria... If I was going to do an SL, I'd definitely do the 600 because V12. And the biggest problem with the SL600 is it is a fucking whale. <laughs> it is so heavy. But it is cool. <laughs> you're, not getting, you're not getting shit out of that SL500 either. That's so true. I'm going to throw out oh, another yeah, idea. Yeah. It's a car that's on the uh, panel right now that might be for sale if you gave enough money it's a manual it's german it's four doors with a v8 it's a 740 oh that's true with a manual swap yeah see that's another swap well, no, you were talking about engine swaps talking about tranny swaps right yeah so so the one thing that's really distracted me from this to go a little afield of 90s car has been a ferrari f430 with a manual swap it's like you buy an F430 for 80 grand, you buy you put a $25,000 transmission swap in it and you have a very very cool fucking car. <laughs> That's true. I give you that. I could see that as a valid distraction. I always struggled with my last M3 because it had that electronic differential. I had to like think about what the computer was going to decide to do with the diff. And and that's what I love. The difference with the, the manual GT3s is they put a mechanical differential in it. Whereas with the PDKs, they, they go electronic and, and they, they try to go best track time. But like, I, I agree with you. It, it was distracting, like where I thought the back end would step out on me on the M3. Like I'd even get to the point where like I, I was about to like try to counter steer and then, yeah. and then the diff would fix it. And I'm just like, what the, <laughs> like, what? I can't, I can't stay ahead of you. Like, what, what are you doing? I, I had friends who had the newer AMG cars. The thing I dislike the most about them is it saves you. It saves you from stupidity. It saves you from anything you want to do to it. And I've said this many times before. I like cars you have to respect. The fact that anybody can get in there and push the pedal to the floor, turn the wheel sometimes and let the car fix the rest of it, there's no challenge in that. There's no fun in that. 
I couldn't agree more. You know, the, that Viper mentality, they didn't put traction control in until they were federally mandated to, you know, your traction control is the pedal. The, and, you're, uh, and, you're, and, you're, and your brain. Well, it's funny. It's funny that you say that. I've I've heard a lot about on the '90s cars that, like, when you try to track them, the ABS can get really confused, and it can, oh, and it, yeah, can yeah. it can it can actually think it's on ice, and so then it doesn't brake very effectively. Sometimes, like, it, it gets confused, and then you can't brake into a turn, and you hit a wall. E thirty sixes love to do that. Going That's to true. I was gonna say, I'm surprised it's taken this long for the Viper to be mentioned. God damn it! I was saving it. I was saving it. That's my I, crown jewel. I know. I I I, I figured you would have led with your favorite car, but you no, know. save uh, the best for last. You got to start at the top, you know. I'm gonna break it down to a complete bare basic one. It's where you can fit multiple in a place of one vehicle if you want to. Oh god! Just an Austin Mini Cooper. I mean, they're cool. It has fun little cars to drive. Uh, yeah, and they built them forever. They were the same up until yeah. the, the, the fatties came. I mean, the, the new minis came out. But uh, <laughs> the, the yeah, not the, not the BMW mini, the real mini. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, they um, built those in England up until the 2000s in the old style. Yep. I love all parts of Call Karcher. I, I appreciate the minis for what they are, but it's not. It just it's doesn't, not you. doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. I think, I think the Viper, you know, we talked a little bit about like cars that the best 90 cars, 90s cars being made in 2001 or 02. Yes, the best 90s Viper from 2016 would be a great purchase. <laughs> you can still buy those new today on any Dodge lot. You so. can still go, you can still find a Dodge dealer that never sold that car. They're exactly. sitting right next to the Dodge Dart. <laughs> <laughs> and the PT Cruiser. At any rate. Shout yeah. out to Romano. That's right, hundred percent. The Viper is number one on my list by far. But in your case, see, I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm like a purist. I want a Targa. I just I just want a Targa because it's the original. It's like a Cobra. The whole when, they, when they first came out with that GTS, where exactly I, I, that's I where still, I was going. I still, I still remember when I was I must think I was a junior in high school when they first came out of GTS. God, that car was gorgeous. So it still is white with blue car. stripes and that hood scoop. Nobody had hood scoops back then, except the W six, of course. Thing was was uh, was evil looking. It was great. They're sub a hundred. You can still get a GTS coupe for less. Yeah. Than you guys are missing. You guys are missing the uh, the best Chrysler product that was not a Viper. I already showed it. That's a here, low yeah. bar. Just so we're clear, it's a <laughs> low, low bar. Well, but go ahead, please SR- tell us. <laughs> the SRT ten truck. Yes, yes. They the put SR- that V ten in the truck. It was a great car. Great truck. I yeah. drove one of those, and that it was the craziest fucking thing I've ever driven. I've driven, I've driven lightning. The SRT ten truck is way more fun. I, I, I go. Because I think I go cyclone though. I think yeah, I go I cyclone. With you on that. To drive home the dangerousness of the original Vipers, I was talking to another instructor at an HBDE, and he said one day a guy showed up in a Viper, and uh, he was talking to to his coach. He goes, "Yeah, yeah, this is my third Viper." I totaled the other two, so I figured I'd better learn how to drive it. Oh, God. And then he totaled the third one at the track. <laughs> I still want one. I don't care. I still that, want one. That, that, that reminds me of the C5 Corvettes, right? Like, those things could snap on you so quick. Of course, I had that 85 Porsche 911 in big iron block way out in the back, right? This was before they started inching it forward every generation. That thing almost killed me once. And the the idea of having to like feather a throttle to like, so like you, you screwed up, but like too little or too much. And just this idea that you just kind of have to bounce on it to keep yourself from dying was, uh, yeah. Widowmakers are funny. So I just heard something I can't believe I just heard. A Porsche owner admitting that the motor was too far back and they have to keep moving oh, forward. Uh, those 80s cars, the right? I mean, so it was this huge iron lump, especially if you took some of the parts out, right? You're in a 2,200 pound car with this, all this weight out back. Yeah, no, it was it was really, really hard to hold a drift. More skill than I, than I have. I couldn't do it. And so the couple of times the back end really got out on me was kind of like puckering type moments. <clears throat> well, since we're talking about German cars now, <clears throat> That we have left a few on the table, I think. And we talked about Mercedes and whatnot. We've mentioned a few BMWs. What about <laughs> another Porsche? I love this idea. I think my next family car will probably be a Taycan or something. Sure. What are you thinking? I've got a couple favorites, all in the 90s. So I'll just rattle them off real quick. 968, 964, 964 RS America, 993, 
928 S4 or GTS? The 968 was a fine car. Its biggest problem was it was a four-cylinder, which wasn't very exciting for buyers. If you can find a club sport, though, whole different animal compared to the stock 968. Yeah, because they cut the counter. Sure. Well, and, and it took everything. It, it took a lot of what the 944 had, which was phenomenal weight balance and spectacular handling, and added something that the 944 has never had, which was power. The turbo. You know, I mean, the stock 944. How dare you impugn the turbo? And, well, the problem with the 968 would be getting real power out because they were 230 horse back in the day. Three but, liter, yeah, and, nothing and, fancy. And, you know, the four cylinder is, is a little tricky. You know, you're right. The the non club like the originals, they, they had a really heavy counterweight and kind of made the motor not as much fun to try and make a smoother German driving experience. I love the idea of a 928. It is the coolest car from the 80s that was <laughs> launched in the 70s and made through 1998. Yeah, but right? it is the coolest car of the 80s. I would totally love a, a 94 or 5 or whatever. If you can find them. I mean, those cars cost so much damn, like yeah. the late model ones. Those cars cost so much money. So I, yeah. I had this idea I was kicking around earlier. There's a shop in Pennsylvania. I can't remember their name now, but they do they do a lot of work on 928 motors. To get through emissions, they launched the 32 valve in 85. Like So you can find a cheap 928 and make a hot rod out of that as opposed to try and buy a 4S or something, which, you know, is just, those cars are $70,000 or whatever, unrestored. I just have to do a quick correction there, Mark, because you said that was the coolest vehicle they like, uh, oh, oh God. presented in the 70s and was available in the 80s. Eric, can you mute him? Square body. Square body. That's all I got to say. Uh, can you box Chevy Caprice? Is that what he just said? Is that what I heard? <laughs> That's a square body too. Holy cow, that's terrible. No, his favorite car, the Ford Taurus wagon. That made it into the 90s, right? <laughs> Mercury Sable wagon. But the thing is, I think the 964 was short-lived, right? 88 to 92. It was only around for four years and it's underappreciated. But the thing that was badass about the 964 is all the variants that it came in in four years. The RS America, the CTR2 Yellowbird recreation that they did, the 964 Turbo. I mean, there's a bunch of crazy, like it's like the last hoorah of the old school 911. And to your point, a car that was built in the 60s that they dragged all the way through the 90s and they finally got it right before they basically started over again with the 993 now don't get me wrong the 993 gorgeous car especially some of those colors they had like that merlot and that ice blue and there's some really neat stuff and i got the opportunity to ride in a 95 twin turbo 993 and that was unbelievably eye-opening experience and it, it still has left an impression on me to this day those cars are amazing so those are on my vote if you're going to go with porsche's all the ones I listed, there's some really cool stuff there in that really short window of time in the early 90s. It's too bad the 964 turbos have gotten up uh, so much in price. Those those are really cool. Those are really cool cars. They they made a bunch of different cool cool fun cars. Yeah, obviously, I'd, if I if I had a lot more money, I'd have a 993 turbo. Of course, car would be badass. Now I think there's another car we've forgotten about. You could buy it on a budget. You'd have a lot of money left over. <laughs> what, what what is this? Maserati. Well, there's always, we'll see, you now you're ruining it. The answer is always Miata, but VR6 Corrado. Oh, we're going to do Corrados. I loved Corrados as a kid. I remember my dad and I, we'd go to this dealership and we'd looked at this. I remember at the time thinking like, this car is $27,000. Are they out of their mind? It was expensive. Yeah. And that's why we could see that one same car every week for a year. <laughs> They never if it was the it. one in DC, if it was the red one in DC, it's the one my dad ended up buying. By the way, just so you know, <laughs> no, it was one in Frederick. It was it was in a Fred, it was in the Frederick Volkswagen dealer. It sat there forever. But God, that car was cool. And I loved the idea of the the supercharged four cylinder before the before they put the VR6 in it and um, G60s, which I prefer the G6 over the VR6. Blasphemer, blasphemer. Well, the, I, the I almost, I almost ride. bought a car. I almost bought instead of that Z28, instead of that 94 Z28, I almost bought a Corrado supercharged uh, four cylinder. The big downside Corrados had was they were heavy compared to anything Volkswagen made. The supercharged was slower than the Scirocco that it replaced, which was a tough sell. And the V6, which was obviously faster, suffered from the fact that it had this giant lump at the front. I mean, they were they were neat looking cars. The problem yeah. with them was they just they like every Volkswagen, they drive the wrong wheels, and the weight distribution sucks. Now, I will say this: 
The VR6 is one of those underappreciated engines, though. And if you follow the VR Society guys on Instagram, they will swap a VR into anything. But it's amazing the amount of power they can get out of that 12 valve. I mean, 900 horsepower is not a stretch of the imagination to do out of that tiny little engine, which is absolutely amazing. But staying with that idea, also a car from the 90s, also from Volkswagen, also available with the VR6, the Eurovan. Think about hot rodding a Eurovan. That'd be pretty slick, man. Sounds nasty, big turbo. You're still going to light up the front end, but it's in a van. If I'm going to hot rod a minivan, I'll do it right, and I will hot rod a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> like Rutledge Wood did? People actually did that. Like like when the, the whole Fast and the Furious thing, it was, it was like when – it was like a second version of when like uh, Dr. Dre got to the suburbs. Right. And, and it was, <laughs> and so all of a sudden you have all these kids thinking about like the crap they're going to do. Like people were legit putting nitrous kits in odysseys. Like it sounds like a joke, but they did it. But what van could you buy with a manual transmission? None. None. That's yeah, fine. Dodge caravan. The Chevy Astro also, I think offered a manual for a couple of years. I know, I know someone who had a Dodge caravan stick shift. When, when I was in high school. Did the Eurovan come with a manual too? This Eurovan I just put in the chat is a manual. There you go. Boom. Exactly. This one's a camper too. Exactly. Well, it's a Westphalia. Westphalia. So Mike, being a BMW guy, BMW fan, I think there's one we've forgotten. Z1? I can't afford an original Z8, but a Z1 with the door thing that drops down. That could the be Z8s fun. are slick. Those are those are hot. These are so hot. I love the Z8s back in the day. It is a Z car. Come on, come on, Mikey. Clown oh, shoe. the clown shoe. That one. Yeah, the clown oh, shoe the started Z, in the Z, 98. The Z3M or whatever. The, the penis mobile. It was like an upside down cock and balls. <laughs> So those are, those are, you can hoon around in those cars. They're light, they're agile, decent power for as, for as big as they are with the 3.2 liter, especially I drove a, a 98 that was, that a gentleman I know special ordered and all this kind of thing. It was a cool car. I had visibility wise. I thought it was a little awkward, but it all depends on your height more than anything, but everybody kind of raves about the clown shoe. You got to get over the aesthetics of it, but it is definitely a hoon car and in typical BMW fashion, throw a dining kit on it or something else like that and make gobs of horsepower. Yeah, absolutely. I, I almost bought a Z4M when I got my E46 M3. I was kind of going between the two, but the original Z3M would, would be a ton of fun. That would be pretty awesome. I, I they're, 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 they're ugly. You either love them or hate them. I think I'd I love mean, one. They're, they're, I think I'd love one. And, that, and that's another car you really have to respect because it's got a boatload of power and no wheelbase to speak of. Yeah. You know, and, and that's fun. So do we have any other suggestions for Mark? I think we should go around the, the horn and give our best Hail Mary. I think so too. Well, I want to I want to highlight a few things. And Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Some of the things you went ooh ah about as we were talking about this. I think 928 was on that list. I think the Audi S8 was on that list. 500 or 500E? No, E500 for sure. And it maybe the BMW 8 like series, walking. right? So those are like the top five kind of out of the list of 30 that we posted out there. But I think well, I think We, Brad's we don't right. have an American one in there. I like the WS6. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. a fun idea. I could do that. Let's shotgun it. Let's start. Matt, good. what would you recommend? 100 grand to spend, one car from the 90s, go. Probably the 500E. Mount Mandan. Well, I was going to say, we didn't, uh, for American cars earlier, I don't think we mentioned it, but the Ford SHO was a bit of a sleeper back in its time. So the get the fuck out of here. With the Yamaha motor? Get the <laughs> fuck out of here. <laughs> Wise guy. What is this Taurus stuff? <laughs> so before it went blobular, the older, boxier... The RoboCop uh, one? A, a, the RoboCop with the Yamaha V6. That's not a bad, that's not a bad suggestion. Ford, Ford Probe. So Mount Man Dan, that you you're a blasphemer, dude. You cannot recommend a Ford as a bow tie man. So what's your shotgun for Mark? No, no, no. I wasn't recommending it because I'm not a fan of the SHO. I was just mentioning it as a mention. Uh-huh. But definitely, like I said earlier, I'm hundred percent on board with the WS6 option because there's a ton of aftermarket stuff you can do and those LS engines will take tons of power. But if you're gonna go with your pin, <laughs> best bang for your buck would be go online, try to find something and ship it because i think you would get it here stateside and have a lot more money to be able to invest in it than if you yeah. were to buy one already stateside this is the slowest speed round i think we've ever done <laughs> yeah because everybody's got 10 other you know things they want to add in there race ron what are you thinking shotgun citation to x11 no that's oh, too God. hard no, I'm, I'm thinking the esplanade all the way the esperante the, the pinos Pla- esperante classy car beautiful makes a lot of power holds people 
it's got modern uh, conveniences and still hauls ass. And you can make a ton of power with that five liter or bigger. I have three, the Ferrari F355, the Shelby Series 1, or one that would actually be attainable for me, the 3000 GT. Shelby Series 1, do we know how much those cost? They're, they're in the stratosphere. They're expensive. Oh, yeah. Nope, out of budget. I like some of the suggestions that have been put out. I mean, I am I was surprised by the WS6 because I forgot about it. And I do really like that car. I think that's a lot of fun. I think you could have a lot of fun with that. But for the amount of money you would spend in a WS6, you would park it in your garage next to your GT3 and go, oh, God, I own a Pontiac. I'd park it on top of my GT3. Yeah, right. <laughs> You will never drive that WS6, and the interior is complete garbage. It's like sitting in your Cavalier from the 80s all over again. Point in case, right? So You would be that's, miserable. That's why I say, if you're, if you're really thinking about going down that route, and you don't want something exotic like the Panos, or you know all these other cars we talked about, I honestly believe, my heart of heart, Viper is the answer because it's already done. It sounds amazing. It looks amazing. It, it's not even moving and it looks fast. It is fast. It's a cool car. It's it's quintessential 90s. They got it right, especially with the GTS Coupe. I don't think you can go wrong. And you're probably going to end up, you know, picking one up, let's say in the market of 70 to 80, you know, pristine condition, low mileage without having to do a whole heck of a lot. And you'll have money left over in your pocket. You know, you build some of these other cars and you're still left with whatever the base car was. Now, the exception to the Viper rule, like I said, is if you go back to the Porsches from the early 90s or mid 90s, there's some really cool stuff there, especially if you could find a low mileage 993 or even a 964 or something like that. But you already have a 911 and you want something different. So I still think my vote lies with the Dodge. All right. All and right. secretly, I want to drive it after you get it. So just let me know. <laughs> and, and I'm going to change, I'm going to drop the Series 1 because they are unobtainium. And I'm going to replace it with the B5 S4. I like that. I like that. I think I'd go S8 if I was going to do Audi. Though. I agree with you on that one. Been there, done that. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw this out there. I know This you is just... for me, just so we're clear. This is for me. Oh, you're not buying me a car? Well, why are we doing this shit? <laughs> <laughs> it's what what should I buy? What should I buy? What should I buy? last time. 90 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Eric was uh, talking some trash on the WS <laughs> just now. But here's the thing, though. Pontiac is no longer a grand. That means it's only going to increase in value. Bullshit. It's going to stay at 15 grand for its eternity. <laughs> no, I, so yeah. I think, no, actually, I do think you're right. I, th I think probably a good condition one would go up. The, the problem is, is like, I'm, like I said, I do want to get into modification and, and personalization of it. And I, I think that will kind of, that will hurt its resale. Of, of a Viper or are you talking about the, Pontiac? Oh, the, the W the, like, you know, the W six or whatever. Of a Viper, I mean, everybody knows that's a death trap. I think if, honestly, if I were going to get a Viper, I don't think I'd get one from the 90s. Like, I think it would scratch that 90s itch, but right. I would get a later one. And, you know, then one of the ones that makes 640 horsepower or whatever, and it's, you're getting that out of the box. And it only costs 20 grand more than the one from the 90s anyway. I mean, I've ridden on track in an ACR and it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite cars ever. I mean, you can keep everything else as, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So just like every What Should I Buy episode, we never really do come to a logical conclusion. Lots of really great suggestions, and I'm going to put air quotes around great. And it was really fun to have everybody on the show. So Mark, hopefully we gave you some food for thought, you know, maybe some things you weren't thinking about, some other things to consider, some sleepers and, and whatnot. So we wish you luck on your journey. We want to follow back up with you and see what you end up buying. You know, thanks for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. Awesome. You know, I really appreciate it. You guys have given me a lot to think about. I, I think it's important for me, like I try not to get married to any one idea. And so I try to find that mix of like the car that's in the right condition and, and kind of checks those boxes. And, and so it's like, I, I it's not like I'm going to come out of this and just pick one car and then I'm going to go and try and hunt and find that. It's more of like, it's kind of broadened my horizons from a search perspective. I will find a car that feels right and I'll pick it up. And you guys have given me a lot of good ideas and, and I've been thinking in different directions from cars and even purchase markets to where I want to do that. So I appreciate well, it. This has been great. Very cool. Very cool. And we want to thank our panel of uh, guest GTMers tonight, you know, Racer Ron, Hazmat, Mountain Man Dan. Obviously, Brad and I are always here. And if you're listening to this episode and you would like to set up your own version of What Should I Buy?, don't hesitate to reach out for us. We'd love to have you on the show and give, a, give you all of our bad recommendations. So until next time. Are we going to do right. a follow-up in about six months when Mark tells us all about the Miata he bought? <laughs>
If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.